My name is Jake, welcome to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna talk about five mistakes to avoid when investing into dividend ETFs. I love investing into dividend ETFs. I truly see it as the purest form of passive dividend investing. You can invest into individual stocks and there's a whole different art and science that goes into that. When you're investing into dividend ETFs, I think it's a lot easier for your normal person to comprehend, understand what they're investing in, and also to have the courage and emotional fortitude to keep investing even when the market is going down. I've been creating investing videos here on YouTube for about five years, and I've seen a bunch of different strategies come and go. You know, when I first started here on YouTube, everybody was talking about QILD, you know, the Global X ETFs. They've kind of fizzled away. Not very many people talk about them very much. They used to have higher fees. They've actually lowered their fees recently because they're there's a lot more competition now. And then you had the uh, cover call ETFs with JP Morgan, Jeppy, and JepQ come out. They've become very, very popular. And here more recently, there's you know different ETFs like Tesla, Kony, tracking single stocks that are, in my opinion, a lot, a lot riskier if you're planning on retiring and actually living off of your portfolio. So needless to say, the, the approach to dividend investing with dividend ETFs has kind of evolved over the last couple of years, but I'm more of an advocate of the tried and true approach. Cause I mean, let's be honest with a lot of these newer ETFs that are just kind of copying other strategies, you know, we all know a copy of a copy is not always the best and it could look a little like this. So then, Doug, I'd like you to meet four. I got a lot. I got a car. Where'd he come from? It's gonna help us out around here a little bit. Just, you know. Yeah, you know, do the day to day stuff. Clean the house and mow the lawn, take out trash. Forget that. What the hell's wrong with him? You know, what? nothing really wrong. You know, he's. Uh, he's a little special. He's fine. He'll be all right. See, what we did was we made a copy from two. And you know how sometimes you make a copy of a copy, it's not quite as sharp as, well, the original. Well, that's kind of what happened. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you know that show, write it in the comments and let everybody know how old you are if you, uh, if you recognize that show. All right, so the first thing that I wanna talk about, the first mistake that you wanna avoid if you're uh, you know, looking at, at dividend investing and investing into dividend ETFs, the very first thing that you wanna avoid is the mistake of investing into ETFs that have really high expense ratios. Now an expense ratio is really just, you know, kind of the overall fee, the management fee, the operating fee, that the fund management company has when you know offering an ETF or an index that you can invest in like you know SHD, DGRO, and the expenses are not all the same across the board, okay? And so if you invest into you know an ETF like DGRO or SCHD, you're going to get a very low expense ratio or you know reasonably low. If you were to invest in the S&P 500 like VOO, you're gonna get even a lower expense ratio. But the main thing that I wanna highlight here when you're investing in the dividend ETFs that you watch those fees because the fees can add up. So with DGRO, it does have a lower expense ratio. And when I compare DGRO with another ETF that I like, I don't currently invest in this, but I've talked about it in the channel on the channel in the past is ticker DTD. And if you look at the expenses, you can see here that it has over a three times you know, three times the expense ratio of DGRO. And you might be asking yourself, well, is it really warranted? Does Do you really want to pay that, that higher expense ratio? And so with DTD and DGRO, they have about 70% overlap in, in them. So you're not going to get much more diversification on a weighted basis. But the difference here with DTD, with Wisdom Tree, is you are going to get a monthly dividend. And that monthly dividend, you know, the fund managers, they do charge more, the ETF does charge more when you get paid a monthly dividend. So something that you wanna watch out for is when you're looking at different ETFs and you're seeing the expense ratio, your first thing you wanna ask is why? Is this index or is the ETF tracking an index that is passive and they don't pay a monthly dividend, well, it should be more so like DGRO where it is a lower expense ratio. If you're getting into dividend ETFs that pay monthly or have a cover call or a derivative strategy on it, then 
yeah, you probably are going to pay a little bit of a higher expense ratio because those are usually a little bit more active or there's a more an active approach, whether, you know, paying you monthly versus quarterly. So the very first thing that you want to make sure that you avoid the mistake of blindly investing into an ETF without understanding what are the fees associated with investing into these ETFs. And something that's very, very important, I get this question all the time, it's a very, very standard question, is well, how do you pay the fee, right? And so you're not actually writing a check or paying something, it doesn't come out of, like you're not gonna see it in your brokerage, you know, a yearly or an annual fee of 0.08%. What happens is it's automatically taken out of the net asset value, the NAV. So when you see the share price, in you know on Google or on Seeking Alpha or wherever, that is the price minus the fee. Okay, so you're not going to see that fee as an expense in your brokerage. It's just merely taken out of the price. And whenever you see the uh, the tr the chart on online, that is the return minus the fees. Okay, so that's important that you understand that. I get that question all the time. And here really quick to really drive home the importance of fees. Let's say for example, you're in your early 20s and you're gonna you know, work for the next 30 years. Let's say you have an investment portfolio of $10,000 and you're you know, investing $1,000 a month. If you're investing into you know, the S&P 500 or DGRO or SCHD as an example, you know, let's take a look at some of the fees. So with the S&P 500, over the course of 30 years, you're gonna pay just $11,500 on the S&P 500, like VOO as an example. Now, if you do the same thing with uh, DGRO as an example, well, you're gonna t pay about three times the fee, okay? Now, if you were to take the example of maybe JEPI or JEPQ, the uh, JP Morgan cover call ETF, if you were to do that, you're gonna see that you're gonna pay quite a bit more. You're gonna pay about 130,000 or 130,000 will be subtracted from the value of your port of the uh, the index, right? So it's important to make sure that you're tracking your fees. Now there's a, there's a bunch of ETFs out there and I'm gonna to touch on them in a second. I just wanna show you how disgusting this is. Absolutely disgusting. If somebody's charging a 1% fee, they'd be able, they better be able to back it up. There's a lot of dividend ETFs, a lot of cover call ETFs out there there, for example, Tesla, as an example, that charge a 1% management fee, an expense fee. It's absolutely insane. You're giving up 1%. And what that looks like if you were to hypothetically invest into something that has a 1% fee over the span of 30 years with these assumptions, you're going to pay a ton of money. Now, let's use another example. Let's say, for example, that you are retiring tomorrow and let's say you have a million dollars and let's say you were to hold that portfolio for 20 years and let's keep the uh, the same 9% rate of return. If you're, let's do this just to make a point. If you're investing in a DGRO, you're going to pay $81,000, $82,000 over a 20 year 20 year time period. Okay, do you follow me? Now, if you were to hypothetically invest a million dollars into an ETF that has a 1% expense ratio, well, you're going to pay you're going to pay almost a million dollars over a 20 year time period. Okay, and you have to ask the question, are you getting a million dollars in return in value? And in most cases, in almost every case, guys, you're not. Okay? The only ones that are making money when it comes to this are the are the fee the fund managers the ones charging these crazy fees don't make the mistake of getting taken advantage of by some of these ETFs that charge just absolutely insanely high fees now let's take a look at the second mistake that you can make when investing in the dividend ETFs and that is not understanding the index that you're invested in. Now, it's really, really important, guys, whether you've been investing for, for decades or you're just getting started, this is the most important thing to understand when you're investing into an ETF, whether it be a dividend ETF or just a you know total market ETF. It's so, so important that you understand what you're getting when you invest into an ETF. So when you invest, for example, into DGRO, what are you getting with, with DGRO? Well, you're getting, you know, you're getting the, uh, the holdings here that you have in here. You're getting, uh, the hundred and you know, 423 individual stocks. But how does, how does this even work when you're investing into a passive index like DGRO, you are investing in the rules 
of this index. Okay, so it's so, so important that you understand because not all ETFs track and follow the same index. Okay, and so something that you can do is if you're investing into an ETF, Google the ETF and try to understand the underlying index or methodology that the ETF is tracking. Because at the end of the day, the ETF will just perform as the index is designed, you know, depending on where what the market does, obviously, right? So you got the rules of the index, and then overshadowing that, you have the performance of the market, what the market is doing, okay? And so this ETF, as an example, DGRO, one of my favorite dividend growth ETFs, is this ETF is not an ETF that iShares or anything that they do, that they have in-house, they use the proprietary index of the Morningstar US Dividend Growth Index, okay? So they are tracking something that's actually outside of their own company. And what they're doing is they're using the rules of the Mar Morningstar Dividend Growth Index. And you can Google this, this is so easy. You just go and Google it and you'll be able to find it. But very briefly, what I wanna show you so that you can understand this, if you're invested into an ETF, like here really quick, let me let me preface this, how, how great this is. If you're investing into a dividend portfolio of 30 stocks, you have to follow up on 30 stocks. If you're investing into two or three ETFs, all you have to do is follow up on the index and understand how the portfolio, how the index is set up. That's why this is such, so much more passive than investing into 30 different individual stocks. If you're investing into an index, all you have to really understand is do your due diligence on how the index or how the rules are set up. So for example, with DGRO, it's very, very straightforward. It takes a look at the US stock market. It takes a look at the, uh, you know, the universe is how they how they phrase it here with with Morningstar, and then what they do is they exclude REITs entirely. So when you invest in a DGRO, you're getting zero REIT exposure. What that means is you're getting 100% qualified. Okay, so the dividend is 100% qualified. Another thing that they look at is they have to have a positive consensus earnings forecast, forward looking, and a payout ratio of less than 75%. So you're not going to get very many high utility or sin stocks in here because of this rule. Do you follow me? And then lastly here that I want to show is that the companies in this index have had to have at least increased their dividend consecutively for at least five years. Okay. And so when you're researching different ETFs, go and watch a YouTube video, go read a blog. But what you really, really want to do, if you want to be a pro with this, if you really want to feel good about what you're doing, go and read up on the index understand how the index is constructed because at the end of the day, you're getting nothing more than the rules of the index. And every ETF, every index has its own rules as long as it's a passive index. If it's an active index, that is entirely different. The rules are based off of the fund manager and the guidelines that they have in place. But as a passive investment like DGRO, SHD, they're subject to the rules of the index. And it's so, so important that you don't mistake that and misunderstand that that's what you're getting when you invest into a dividend ETF. The third mistake that I wanna talk about are the wolves in sheep's clothing. And there's a few of them out there. Now, I know that there's very strong opinions when it comes to some of these cover call ETFs. You know, a lot of new dividend investors are gonna look at the, the dividend yield and be like, oh, they have a 12% dividend yield. That means it's good. And then, you know, I am Groot and they can't think of anything else to say, right? Like, you know, if I didn't care about you guys and I didn't care about you know, any of you, I probably would just tell you what you want to hear. Yes, high dividend equals good, but I care about you and I wanna share with you my honest opinions about some of these ETFs and why I would absolutely avoid them like the plague. So a couple of them that you wanna make sure that you're, a couple of things that you wanna be aware of. So the wolves in sheep's clothing, that's kind of a mouthful, is there's some things that you wanna be careful of. So the very first thing is you wanna make sure that you're taking a look at the expense expense ratio. And you can see here that Tesla has a, an incredibly high expense ratio. Just that alone, I would avoid this like the plague. But let's say you're like, you know what? I really like Tesla. I wanna invest in a Tesla and I wanna invest it into it via an ETF. Therefore, it's safer. Well, not really. I mean, you can see the share price has just plummeted and they've done a, a reverse split, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that, but I thought they, I heard they were doing a reverse split. But anyways, so you got some of these newer ETFs from Yieldmax, and I don't know very much about the company Yieldmax. They could have good intentions. 
okay. If you have good intentions, that that's great. And my, my view of this is they are totally taking advantage of retail investors like you and me. And they're seeing the success of Jeppy and JepQ from JP Morgan. And they're taking advantage of retail investors because they know that retail investors, they, they look at the dividend yield and they think that that's all that matters. And so they put their hard earned money in these, these ETFs and they charge crazy fees. So I see them as wolves in sheep's clothing and they're taking advantage of, of retail investors. So a couple of things that you want to take a look at. I do not like cover call ETFs that track one single stock or that don't track an index because the risk is still there. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. So it's very, very important that you understand what you're invested in when you take a look at some of these cover call ETFs. Some of them are pretty good, right? Like you got the Devos of the world. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm okay with Devo. Devo's fine. I really like Jeppy and JepQ. I think they're fine. The Global X ones are okay, but you have to accept the fact that you're going to have your capital eroded over time unless they change their, their, their approach. With them selling at the money, you know, your principal is going to slowly erode away. Okay, and that's why I like JepQ and Jeppy because they are selling out of the money and that means there's upside potential. Now, if you didn't understand a thing that I just said, that's okay, you're not losing out too much. Uh, these are really for those in investors who are looking for income today, okay? And so a couple of them that I would definitely be very cautious before blindly investing in them or blindly watching someone on YouTube that doesn't even invest in the ETF but tells you how great they are because there's a ton of videos out there. Some of these are absolute garbage. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I just can't. I mean, I look at this and I'm just like, seriously? Like they must think that we retail investors are so stupid, um, but ah, man, I, I don't know. So. ETFs like this, JEPI with a Y, right? I've seen JEPI, JEPI, right? This is the uh, the copy of a copy. Watch the fees, watch and you know do your due diligence and understand what you're truly getting with some of these ETFs because there's a lot of garbage. The next mistake that you really want to avoid, now this is so, so important guys, especially when you start making more money and taxes become a bigger drag and a bigger reality in your life, you want to understand the differences between a qualified dividend and a non-qualified dividend. A qualified dividend is just a domestic company here in the United States like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, you know, those are the type of companies headquartered here in the United States that are not invested into real estate those are considered a qualified dividend. A non-qualified dividend would be, for example, a real estate investment trust, a REIT. It could be a bond. It could be an investment that is like an interest income, right? You're getting interest instead of an actual dividend. And so it's important that you understand the differences and how they're taxed because a qualified dividend is taxed at the most favorable rate here in the United States, very, very favorably versus a non-qualified dividend, it's taxed as ordinary income and there's no benefits at all. Something that is not talked a lot about here on YouTube, most dividend investors here on YouTube don't even know this, but when you invest into a stock that is outside of the United States, there is also an international tax. So in addition to paying taxes, you're also paying an international tax. Now, do you understand that? Do you know what that means? So let me give you an example. If you were to invest, if you're, say, you're, for example, you're living in the United States, and let's say you buy you know, TD Bank or Nova Scotia or Canadian Rail or whatever, and they pay you a dividend. Well, because you're not a resident of Canada, because you're living in the United States, you're gonna have to pay a 25% ta international tax in addition to your tax here in the United States. Do you understand that? So that is why it's like, holy cow, taxes are a thing. So let's say hypothetically, you get a $100 dividend from TD Bank, right, as an example. Well, right off the bat, you're gonna have to pay international tax of $25. So you only made $75. Well, that $75 is also going to be taxed and it's going to be taxed based off of your, your individual tax rate. So it's double taxed when you're investing into international stocks. Another thing here while we're talking about taxes with dividend ETFs, how you can very quickly know if you're going to be paying taxes 
on US you know, focused ETFs, like for example, SPYD. This is a very, very popular ETF. And one of the reasons why SPYD is so popular is it does have a very high starting dividend yield. Four and a half percent is a very high starting dividend yield. But something that you'll notice with this ETF is it's not entirely tax friendly. When you go into the holdings, you're gonna notice that 26% of this ETF is allocated into real estate. So that means a quarter of the dividend will be contributed to a non-qualified dividend. So it's not 100% qualified. Now, 25% is not a crazy amount, right? It's not horrible. So in a taxable account, it's not gonna be the most favorable to hold this in a taxable account because you will be charged you know, the non-qualified rate because it has real estate. Another example here would be with DGRO. You know, we, when we looked at the, um, the methodology or the index, it said it excluded REITs. You can see here very quickly that there are no REITs allocated here. It's all US, so this is 100% qualified. So that's how you can quickly view in an ETF the percentage that it could, you know, reasonably, that you could reasonably assume at tax time how much you're gonna be paying in qualified versus non-qualified. Another thing here, like really quick, I'm breezing through this because this is such a popular ETF with JEPI, for example, or JEPQ, they're very similar. You can go and take a look at their fund story. If you Google JEPI or JEPQ, you can go and take a look at some of their documents and you can see here, let me zoom in. You can see here that the dividend income, the overwhelming majority is gonna be in the form of a premium, the distribution, which is non-qualified. So everything that you see here in orange, you're gonna pay a non-qualified rate, but what you see here in blue, you will pay a qualified rate. So when you go and you get your 1099 dividend form, you'll notice that about 90 or so percent is gonna be in a, a non-qualified and 10% will be in qualified. And it, you know, if you use a M1 as your brokerage or any other brokerage, they will send this to you in your 1099 dividend form and they do this all for you. So if you were to upload it to TurboTax, so easy, you can do this really, really easy. It's not not intimidating. So don't don't get scared when you see stuff like this. It's a very easy process at tax time. The last mistake that people make when investing in a dividend ETFs is not understanding their investment time horizon. Now, this goes with individual stocks as well as dividend ETFs, but it's so important that you understand how to invest based off of your investment time horizon because that really dictates how, which investments you should be selecting and which ones you should be focused on because not all dividend ETFs are created equal. Now, I sound like a broken record because I don't really know how else to phrase this so that people can understand it. It's how I understand it is your investments, your dividend ETFs, your stocks are just vehicles. They're there to get you from point A to point B. And point B is your destination. Where are you going to? And so not, you're not gonna wanna drive a Ferrari up into the mountains, you know, off road, because that's not the right vehicle for that destination. It's important to understand that your vehicle is just there to get you from point A to point B and which vehicle is going to serve and help you in the best way possible given your investment time horizon. So if you're in your early 20s as an example, you have a long-term time horizon in most cases, maybe 20 or 30 years. Well, in that case, you probably wanna focus on growth. And what you can do is when you're looking at growth versus income today, you wanna look at, okay, if you have a 20 or 30 year time horizon, you don't need the yield today. You don't need a high dividend yield today, but instead you probably would opt towards having a lower starting dividend yield, but a higher dividend growth rate because the dividend is growing. And the purpose there is towards the back end, once you reach your destination, the growth would have outpaced the income that you would have gotten on the front end if you would have front loaded it. So with investing into growth, you're loading it up on the back end. And if you're, you know, have a short term time horizon, say maybe in your 50s, you would want to do the reverse where you're focused more on a higher yield today and maybe sacrifice a little bit on the growth. Okay. Because your time horizon is different. Your destination is different in that in that case. And so when you're looking at different ETFs, I'd encourage you to go and take a look at them. Go into the dividend section on Seeking Alpha. Seeking Alpha, you can do this for free. You don't have to have the premium version to do this. If you do want to sign up to Seeking Alpha Premium, you can use my link in the description below. You'll get a, uh, a discount with using my link. But I, I, use, I use Seeking Alpha all the time. But uh, one thing that you can do is you can t go under the yield section and look under yield on cost and run kind of a hypothetical scenario. If you would have invested invested into SPHD 10 years ago, what would your initial yield on cost be versus 
where it's at today or 10 years ago. And you can kind of see, visualize, I like this because you can visualize kind of how the yield has grown, your yield on cost has grown. Because this is so powerful. And especially if you're retiring, maybe in your early 60s, you wanna make sure that you're investing into something that is still going to continue to grow. Maybe it's not growing 10 or 12%, but you wanna make sure that the investment is still growing. Another example here could be with DGRO as a simple example. It's been around almost 10 years. You can see here that it has a starting yield of around a little over 2% and it's hovered around this 2% for about the last 10 years. But something that you'll notice is that it has a 10 year yield on cost of over 5%. So this one has actually grown over 100% over the last just about 10 years. And if you were to expand this out, and if we were to use history as any indicator of future returns, which are never guaranteed, obviously, and so you could reasonably assume with a higher growth rate, with a longer term time horizon, you're gonna see a higher dividend growth rate and a higher yield on cost over an extended period of time. So the main takeaway here is understand your investment time horizon. If you have a long-term time horizon before you plan on living off the dividend, Okay, I'm talking about that, living off the dividend, reinvesting the dividends all day. But when you're living off the dividend, that's your destination, that's your time horizon. If you have a long-term time horizon, you wanna focus on growth today and yield later. If you have a short-term time horizon, you wanna flip that upside down, you wanna focus more on a current yield today, and you're probably gonna sacrifice a little bit on the growth, but that's okay because that's your destination, that's your time horizon. And it's the mistake that a lot of new investors make. I see this all the time. Time. The mistake that new investors make is in their early 20s, they have a 20 year or 30 year time horizon before they plan on living off their dividends and they're investing like a six or a 7% dividend yield. It's not efficient. That's not ideal. Okay. The tax drag, regardless if it's in a tax advantage account like a Roth IRA, the total return is going to be lower. And so it's important that you understand how to invest based off of your investment time horizon and how you can use these vehicles, these ETFs, to achieve your financial goals. I hope that the video was helpful. I hope that you learned something new. I hope that this opened your eyes to you know, some things to avoid and to think, some things to look out for when you're investing in the dividend ETFs. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. 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 Please sub sub subscribe. Huh? You know what? I think we're gonna be friends. Can everyone say hi to my friend? That's crazy. I just wanted to say thanks. I'm glad you came along, partner. <laughs>